Hello, welcome to our midweek Bible study. We're going to be in the book of Job, chapter 31. Um, just some, some updates on some prayer requests that we've had. We want to continue to pray for Marisha. And uh, she's uh, um, getting a little weaker, but just uh, that's uh, Becky DeBus' mom, and she's under hospice care, and she's doing okay. So just keep her in prayer. Uh, continue to pray for Kyson as, as Kelly Burnett's uh, grandson. Uh, as of, of this recording, he is uh, doing better, but still in the hospital. Uh, David Lazarus' surgery went, went well, but his recovery is, is, is uh, tougher than they thought it was going to be. He's in a lot of pain. So we just pray for, for their pain and, and the suffering that they've had. Continue to pray for uh, a local man named Tim Hennessy, Raina Gloria, his wife, and uh, they've been part of this community for so long. Anyway, he is dealing with cancer, and um, Anna and I were able to visit with him this week and just continue to, to pray for him as he goes through uh, chemo. I'll be with Chad Hunter dealing with kidney issues and dialysis. Uh, Becky and Hans' uh, camp in Mexico is going on this week. Keep him in prayer. Uh, keep our, our dear friends Beth Klopek and Wade in Tennessee in prayer as they deal with ALS and uh, and, and uh, Wade taking care of her. And uh, we'll just keep praying for these things. And, and uh, thank you for your faithful prayers. We've certainly seen God do some incredible things. Uh, and continue to pray for Isaac. That is um, Alexis Hickman's boyfriend, he was in a motorcycle accident. He's got quite a bit of pain and suffering there. And so we'll just keep those in, in prayer. Uh, reminder that this Sunday is Easter Sunday. We are having a uh, sunrise service at the Clintons, 2800 Fresno Road um, at 6 a.m. And then it'll be followed. We'll come back here to the church for pancakes, as we've kind of traditionally done. And then We'll have a regular service at 10 a.m., no Sunday school, but regular service at 10 a.m. And so 6 a.m., sunrise, followed by pancakes, and then regular service at 10 a.m. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and many prayer requests on our mind. We just continue to pray for each of these individuals, Lord, that are going through both spiritual, some financial, many with physical issues, surgeries, and, and alike. So we pray for them, God, as we've mentioned them. Uh, you know what's going on in each and every one of their situations. Uh, bless our study today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're in Prov uh, Job chapter 31. And, and Job 31 is an interesting chapter. As they've all kind of been. We're going to go through one chapter today. If you look at the very end of Job 31, it says the words of Job are ended. So we've gone through three rounds of questions from his friends, uh, Zophar, Eliphaz, Bildad, and and we've seen Job answer these uh, accusations that his trials and tribulations are all a part of, of some hidden sin in his life. And he's staunchly defended himself while at the same time uh, going through these ups and downs of, of you know, he better off dead to I know my Redeemer liveth. And, and they're very typical that we would probably do the same thing. And so in this last um, kind of defense of Job and how this, the, the book works after Job is done with chapter 31, we don't hear much again from him. Uh, we hear uh, uh, from a man named Elihu for a few chapters, a younger man. And then uh, finally, when we get to the later chapters, we hear from God and that those chapters are tremendous. We, we've been anticipating getting to those uh, for sure. But let's look at um, chapter 31, and, and I'll explain a little bit about what's going on here after we read the first verse. He says, I've made my a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon young women? And so what's happening here is, is he is going to, to make these statements that are, are, are called oath of innocence. Um, and they are basically if then statements. Um, they come from 1 Kings 8 31. Let me read that to you. It says, When anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, 
Then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked, bringing uh, his way on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. So this oath that they would take was was uh, called this oath of innocence. And it's an if then, you know, you, you stand in the temple and you claim, if I've done this, then I deserve this. And if I've done this, then I deserve this. If you look at chapter 31, just as a preview, uh, verse seven is if, verse eight, uh, verse five starts with if, verse seven starts with if, nine if, 10 uh, then, uh, then we get to 13 is if, 16 is if, 19 if, 20 if, 21 if, 24 if, 25 if, 26 if, 29 if, 31 if, 33 if, 38 if, 39 if, 40 if, 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 if. So this is his final kind of oath of innocence. And it's an idea that if I have done these things, then I deserve to be punished. But if I haven't done these things, I don't deserve to be punished. We see this uh, in David's life, in, in Psalm 7, verse 3, it says, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who has peace with me, or have plundered my enemies without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let them trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in dust. So it's, it's almost, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, man, if I've, if I've lied to you, then may lightning strike me. That's an oath of innocence. You know, I'm, I'm proclaiming my innocence by inviting God's punishment if I'm lying. And it, it's a way of, of bringing God into it in a way of, 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 of proclaiming your innocence. Well, uh, so this is going to be a chapter of Job proclaiming his innocence. And, and how we're going to look at this chapter is he's going to be proclaiming his innocence in a lot of different areas. And so what we're going to, to do is look at these areas as areas that are important to, to be innocent in. And if we're not innocent in those areas of our lives, uh, we need to repent and become innocent and, and become right in those areas. Um, knowing this, that, that part of the problem with, with Job is, is even if he's right, and we know that God calls him a man who is blameless and, and that God holds him in high accord, but anyone who stands before God trying to get to heaven based on what they did good, they're guilty. We're all guilty before God. The truth is, Job is, is no more a righteous man than any sinner on the, on the earth. There's none righteous, no, not one, God says. Um, so the truth is, he deserves the boils. Uh, the, 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 the correct response is the fact that, that these boils and the loss of all of his material things in his family was not a wrath of God because he sinned. That we know that's not true. But it doesn't mean he's perfect. It doesn't mean he still doesn't need salvation. Um, so the first thing he says, you know, is if I, I, I have made a covenant with my eyes, why then should I look upon a young woman? So he starts with uh, this list of things that, that he has tried to do right in his life. And the first thing, he's made a covenant with his eyes. And I like that statement. It, it, it is very difficult to make a covenant with your eyes. Here's what the Bible says in, in, in uh, Psalms 101.3. I will set no, nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the wick, work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Per, a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. And so the writer in Psalm says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. In other words, he's made a covenant with his eyes. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, that everything in the world is 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 that is worldly and sinful is 
comes out of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, Satan he looked at Eve and said, you know, just look. He got her to look at this tree and think about eating that, that fruit she never ate before and that she would be like God. So he, he, he took the lust of her eyes to look upon the only thing she couldn't have. And you know how human nature is to, to want what you can't have. And lust of her flesh, what would it taste like? And then the pride of life. Um, and so this covenant is made with the eyes not to, to put anything wicked before it. Now, here's the problem. Um, you may make that covenant, and, and you ought to make that covenant. But sometimes we can't control what, what is placed before our eyes. And, and I'm not sure how far or, or, or deep you should go with this covenant. You know, it would almost mean you'd have to, to get rid of your phone because so many things pop up on that thing. And, and uh, you know, here we are recording a message that's going to be put on YouTube. Uh, and boy, there's a lot of things that ought not be before your eyes that show up on YouTube or on TikTok or those little, you know, 10 second little video things that, that it, it's a very strange thing. The eyes are, are, are a very a window to the soul, so to speak. So we've got to, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Um, but it's more difficult in this day and age to, to do that. And so this, this discipline is, is more needed. Matthew 5, 27 says this, when it comes to looking at, uh, uh, females, it says, you have heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust at her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for the whole body to be cast into hell. So we make this, this covenant with our eyes, knowing that, that our eyes cause us to sin. And if you look at it and, and, and imagine that adulterous situation in your brain, according to God, he just considers it already done. So, so he's right here. Again, Job saying, boy, it, let me, let me tell you about how I live. I mean, I've made a covenant with my eyes to protect myself. And, uh, and, and we ought to do the same thing, but it's, it's difficult. Verse 2 says, For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high, if not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps. In other words, he's saying, you know, it, it, it is God's rightful, we're going to talk about this in a second, but it's God's right, he's just to, to punish. And, and it's his allotment. And, and we know that the inheritance of the wicked is destruction. Uh, and then he asks the question, but doesn't he see my ways and count my steps? Doesn't he know? Because he's going to go from verse 4 to verse 5, which is all the if verses. And so he's going to let God know all that he's done. Uh, wondering if, if God has even seen it because of the state that he's in. Well, we know. We, we talked about this before last week, that God's eyes are on the wicked and the good. He knows our steps, and, and we want to trust him with our steps. Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. We want God to be the author and finisher of our faith. So not only does he see our steps, but we want him to direct our steps. Proverbs 20, 24, a man's steps are of the Lord. How then can man understand his own way? Yes, he sees our steps, and hopefully he's guiding us. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way, Psalm 37, 23. Um, so we want to not only have God direct our steps, but we want to follow in his steps. First Peter 2, 21, for to this you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. So yeah, not only does God see our steps, but he orders our steps, but he gives us an example to follow. And so 
this is the, the, the kind of premise of this final uh, defense of Job, his, his oath of innocence. If I've done these things, and so he starts out with, you know, I, I've made a covenant with my eyes. God, are you watching my steps? Do you see what I've done? And then he's going to take the rest of this chapter to tell God what he's done. Um, and he says in verse five, uh, this is his uh, oath of, of being honest and, and, and innocent from falsehood. He says, Lord, I've walked, if I've walked in falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on the honest scales that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart has walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat, and let my harvest be rooted out. So there's these, these if-then phrases. Um, he says an interesting thing. He says, you know, let me be weighed on honest scales. And that's the beauty of, of this relationship with Christ, because we are only going to be weighed on the scales that are, are the righteous scales of, of God. The Bible says, if we confess, confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, so I want to stand before God because only God will judge me honestly. We get judged all the time, uh, but usually the people judging us have a, a motive for it, but a hidden agenda, but God doesn't. We're going to be weighed, and it's not like our good versus our bad, like I used to think. Uh, it is... Is your name written in the book, Man's Book of Life, or is it not? It's it's fair. You have the whole world, and and there's neither Jew nor Greek nor rich nor poor, and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, and if you're, you know, either he'll say, you know, you are my child, come to see me, or he says, I never knew you, depart from me. And so, which is it going to be? It was Psalm. Uh, 711 says God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. He is a just judge. Praise God for that. I, I want to be judged by God because he'll be merciful and gracious. And he knows, he knows my heart. He knows how I feel about him. Many people would accuse me of not being a Christian. And, uh, you know, you could say I'm not a great Christian. And, and that would probably be true, uh, but you can't say I'm not a Christian. That's that's the scale I'm willing to stand upon with God. Acts seventeen thirty says, "Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance to this by." to all by raising him from the dead. So, so Christ's resurrection and he ascended to heaven is sitting at the right hand of God and, and we'll all be judged uh, by this righteous resurrected Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And uh, Jesus calls me friend and, and my relationship with him is, is, is only good because of what he's done. And so I'm willing to stand on those scales of integrity, so to speak. I, and, and what he's saying here is, is his three friends would doom him to hell. He would rather stand before God. And if he is found guilty, then he accepts that. Uh, but what his friends have to say aren't going to determine anything about his eternal future. Um, verse 9 he claims his innocence with covetousness. He says, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I've lurked at my neighbor's door, this is the uh, coveting your neighbor's things or coveting your neighbor's wife, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down to her. For that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment, but that would be a fire that consumes the destruction and would root out all my increase. Yeah, 
again, he's, he's going to go through these things that they remember they've accused him of you're guilty of something. Why don't you just admit it? And he says, you know, if I've done this, if I've done this, then yeah, bring on that, that punishment. It's what I deserve. Um, but the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 3, fornication, uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Psalm 107, 8, oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. So covetousness should not be named among us. We ought to be satisfied in our souls with salvation in Christ and, and not be coveting, not be wishing we had more and being constantly depressed because we don't. Uh, just uh, be content in the things that you have. Uh, the next is, is he, he's been kind. He says, verse 13, if I have despised the cause of a male servant or a female servant when they complained against me, or then what then shall I do when God rises up, when he punishes me? How shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? So he says, look, if I have not been kind to those who, who served me, you know, then punishment I'm deserved, he says. But, but I recognize that, that the rich and the poor, are, they have this in common. They were all created by God. The Bible says, Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And so when we look at the world, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Uh, Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing with selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others higher than themselves or better than themselves. Look not only after your own interest, but also the interest of others. So there, there's, he says, I've been kind. You know, I've, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I've, I've not been false. I've, I've not coveted. I've, I've, and if I have, then I deserve everything that's happened to me. Um, verse 16 uh, through 23, he talks about that he hasn't been greedy. He says, if I've kept the poor from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or eaten morsel so by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it. But from my youth, I reared him as a father. And from my mother's womb, I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or a poor man without covering, if his heart has not um, blessed me, and if he was not worn with the fleece of my sheep, if I raised my hands against the fatherless when I saw I had help at the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me. And because of his magnificence, I cannot endure. Boy, if I've not been uh, giving and, and giving warm uh, food and warm clothing to those in need, boy, then yeah, I, I've been so blessed if I'm not sharing it. Then let my arm fall off from my shoulder. That's an if then, isn't it? It says, God judge me. Uh, but it, it's an oath of innocence. I've done these things. And if I haven't done these things, then, then let my arm fall off. Um, that's that old, you know, if, you're, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out kind of a, an idea. Um, so give. The Bible says if anyone, in, in Matthew 540, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, turn not away. Pretty plain and simple there, isn't it? Proverbs 19, 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. Isn't that a good one? He'll pay back what he has given. 1 John 2, 16. By this we know, because he laid down his life for us. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, 
how does the love of God abide in him? So we again, we see these things that Job is proclaiming to have done. And if I've not done these things, then I deserve these punishments. But then we can take these things and also put them into our own lives and say, we ought to be doing these things. And there's plenty of New Testament and proverb verses that tell us to do these things. Um, so we don't want to be greedy, but we do want to be generous. Uh, the next is we don't want to trust in riches or idols. Um, he says in verse 24, if I've made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I rejoice because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained so much, uh, we see that it's not a sin to be rich. It, it really isn't. But to trust in those riches and to hold yourself in high esteem over others because of your riches is wrong. If I observe the sun when it shines and the moon when it's moving in its brightness, so my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment for I would have denied God who is above. I don't want to worship the sun and the stars or the moon. Um, I don't need a horoscope. I have God. He directs my steps. He guides my path. He has a will for me. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I can't predict it by looking at a, a star or looking at a tarot card or going to a palm reader. God is the only one. God is the only one who knows my future. So I don't want to trust in those riches. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Uh, verse 29 and 30, he says, I've, I've not been involved in vengeance. He says, if I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me or lifted up myself when evil found him, indeed, I've not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. We know that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He says, I've never asked for vengeance on my enemies. Uh, the Bible says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Don't let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord sees it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Proverbs 24, 17. Uh, let God take vengeance, and, and we know that he will. Psalm 37, the righteous are going to shine as the noonday. Uh, verses 31 and 32, he says, I've, I've not lacked hospitality. He says, if men or my tent, if, if the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? But no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. He says, I've, I've been kind. I've been helpful. I've not resting on my riches. I'm in a covenant with my eyes. I, I, if I've not done these things, may punishment come upon you. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, 10, to be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. So it's interesting as we see Job defend himself in these different areas that God directs us to be the same way in these areas. Uh, the difference is this. Uh, even if you're perfect in these areas of your life, we're still sinful and we're still de deserving of death. And, and that's where Job is, is a little off here. And, and he's right in the fact that, that there's no besetting sin that has caused this current plight that he's in. Uh, but these works of, of, of kindness and goodness, um, they are not why he's going to heaven. If he's going to heaven, he's going to heaven because of the grace of God and the mercy of God. And that's the same for us. And then we're going to get to some incredible verses here. And this is really where we want to uh, bring it home a little bit as we finish this chapter up. Um, uh, these next five verses are a little difficult um, for me to understand in, in the light of Job. But they're perfectly understood in the light of Christ. 
So he says, if I've covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Remember, Adam hid from God. And that word Adam means mankind. And it could be all of mankind, but it, it, we can relate it to Adam for sure. Because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt of families so that I kept silent and did not go out on the front door. And he says, if, I, if I've covered my sins, then, then you're right. I deserve all this if I've done this. But the, the premise is he hasn't done this. And he says, this is where it gets really good for me, I think. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Oh, that I had an advocate. Oh, that I had a mediator. Oh, that I had somebody who would listen to my oath of innocence. Well, we do. Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Uh, he is our advocate. He is our mediator. Then he says this, Oh, that I had the one to hear me. Here is the mark, oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. Well, he has. The book is written. And that book is the word of God. And there's a book written that has named the Lamb's Book of Life that has uh, those who are deemed innocent permanently written in there. No one can pluck you out of his hands. No one can blot your name out. So we do have one that hears us. When we cry to God and not declare to God, I am innocent, I've not done anything. No, we go to God and says, God, I am guilty. And if you do not forgive me of my sins, then I am going to hell. But God says, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just and right to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and place your name in the Lamb's book of life never to be blotted out. And then we can get to verse 36 and 37, which says, surely, I would carry it on my shoulder and bound it on me like a crown if I just knew. If I knew, it would change everything. I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince, I would approach him. Oh, if my prosecutor, oh, if my God would hear me, if he would write a book and declare my innocence, Ah, I'd be like a prince, able to approach it. Well, how about this verse here? Hebrews 4, 14, seeing that we have a great high priest who passed through heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted just as we were, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Oh, we can come boldly. We can come like that prince uh, uh, and approach him knowing that he has written a book. And this book is, is in our hands. And in this book, it declares anyone who will confess their sins to Jesus, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, Anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, anyone who confesses that he is Lord and believes that he's risen from the dead, anyone who trusts in Jesus, innocent, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are now a child of God and we can come boldly to the throne of God in the name of Jesus and talk with him and pray with him and rejoice in him and praise his name what a what a gift that that we can see what job is talking about because it's been given to us uh through jesus christ incredible well he closes this book with with if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together if i've eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their life lose their lives then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. It's, it's, it's the final 
I've done any of these things, if I deserve death, I'll take it. If I deserve hell, I'll take it. The problem is Job does not want to stand before God on his own merit, and neither do we. We want to stand before God on the merit of Christ and say to God, not, boy, if I've done any of these things, punish me, because we would lose that argument. But if we say, if I confess my sins, then he's faithful just to forgive me my sins. That's the if. If I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart he's risen from the dead, then I will be saved. Those are the ifs that we want to be. We don't want to be in this mode of, if I've done anything, God, that deserve hell, then give it to me. We do not want to stand before God on that at all. We stand on Christ. And because of that, we, we are different than Job. Job here is confused. If I've done these things, if I've done these things in our life, we have done these things wrong. Now we want to do it better. But because of Christ, we can have this first. He who believes in the Son, 1 John 5, 10, has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony of God that is given of a son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. See, we are not where Job is. Anyone who is depending on their works for salvation never knows if they're saved because they never know if they're going to make a mistake or, or what they've done. And they have this oath of innocence and we have an oath of guilt. We say, God, we are guilty. But then God forgives us of our sins. And then we know we have this confidence. You're boldly coming to God as one of his children because we know he can't lie and he's forgiven us of our sins. Job deserves the boils, just like we deserve hell. But through the mercy and grace of God, God has, has, has seen him as one who is blameless. And God sees us through the eyes of the Son. Thank God for that. I hope you've trusted in him. I hope you believe that he is the, the, the only scales that matter. And your eternity will be weighed on the eternal scales that, that Christ has. And, and, and only one thing determines to be on the right side of the scales. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. Do you have the Son today? I hope that you do. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We continue to pray for these prayer requests. Be with our sunrise service and Easter Sunday. Lord, we celebrate the incredible gift of the resurrection. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Hope to see you Sunday. If not, there will be a uh, Easter message uh, posted on our YouTube channel for you. All right. God bless you.